Okay. All right. Hi, hi, Siva. Can you hear me? Yep, clear. Can. Okay. Philip's there. Ah, Philip's in. Good. Yeah. Um. Okay, we're waiting for Param. I'm just logging into Facebook as well. So message on uh, WhatsApp. Sorry? Message on WhatsApp. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we already have uh, people coming in to start. So, is everyone in? Param in? Yeah, Param's there. Can hi, hi, us? Param. Can you hear us? Still connecting. To audio, okay. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, is everyone all right with audio? Yep. Okay, yep. excellent. I'm on. Okay, so we are live, Faram. Yeah. All Great. right. Thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. Um, I think, first of all, I need to say thank you to all the panelists. We've got a wonderful team of panelists with us today. Very, very lucky to have an excellent team. Um, we have had quite a bit of people who registered for the Zoom. So we have decided to go live on Facebook as well. Um, I hope this is clear and live to everyone. Before we start, let's have some just basic ground rules, um, house rules. Lah. So guys, yeah, as, as the panelists are speaking, you know, try and not um, say anything in between. We have a 10 minute Q&A at the end. So please um, feel free to ask us questions towards the end. This is a, a one hour presentation. So we will each take about 10 minutes to present our slides. We're going to be presenting on different areas. And um, if you have any questions, raise your hands. Please ask us at the end. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to do a quick introduction of the esteemed uh, team that we have. Um, Prof. Philip George will be starting. A consultant psychiatrist and addiction specialist, a very good friend of mine. Um, excellent clinician, works in the field of addictions. Uh, Prof. Philip is also a psychiatrist at Tuanku Jaffa Sramban, at Asunta Hospital and the Mind Faculty. And he also sees patients for us at Solace as well. Um, certified in Substance Abuse, University of Melbourne, published extensively. <laughs> wow, the CV goes on and on, Philip. <laughs> okay, so I, I'll just cut it short. I, I'm rushing for time. I'm trying to limit it within five minutes. Everybody has got pages of uh, bio to read. Um, if we're ready, can we start off with uh, uh, Philip? Yes, please. Yeah. Yep, <coughs> you can start. Okay, so I, I, I will be, um, what do you call it, sharing the slides as we go on. And um, I will uh, hand it over to Philip to start off. Okay. 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 <coughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Prem. Uh, can we have it on a slideshow, please? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on alcohol use disorders. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prem from Solas for helping to organize this. I think it's timely that we actually discuss this uh, because it's a period of time when substance use can actually be a way for people to cope with the stress and you know the new lifestyle that we're actually leading on to now. Uh, so can we go to the next slide, please? Oops, I think Dr. Brem just took a walk. <laughs> anyway, I, I think I'll be focusing mainly on detox protocols. Um, I'm going to put in uh, some of the facts about uh, withdrawals from alcohol and also some of my own personal experience in managing people with uh, alcohol use disorders. Uh, 
I did want to start with a little bit of introduction first. Uh, Dr. Prem, still there, or is he? Prem, can you change the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so we're not too sure about the problem in Malaysia. Statistics seem to differ from the National Health and Mobility Survey to you know what WHO suggests, but it's roughly between two to five percent of people with an alcohol dependence problem in Malaysia. And males, of course, outnumber females. Uh, but there are other statistics that are alarming. For example, binge drinking, which happens to be about 40% of young uh, uh, Malaysians. Uh, and also the amount of consumption, we seem to be the 10th highest alcohol consumers uh, in the region. Uh, we don't know either whether alcohol use has been on the rise since the pandemic, but we know that in other countries, they have reported large growth of sales, including in the US as well as in the UK. Uh, I believe locally as well, there's been a spate of drink driving issues, and that has been put up in the public limelight, and that can only be a result of perhaps higher alcohol use problems since the pandemic started as well. Next slide, please. So when people come in for treatment, the important first step is really to understand where they are in the, in, in the whole scheme of motivation to change. We can't push or force someone into saying, okay, let's get you into treatment. You got a detox and then after that, you need to go in for relapse prevention unless they are prepared and they're determined to actually work with you. Uh, it'll be a huge, you know, sort of a waste of effort and time. And also it can be uh, very dangerous if we were to push or force people into treatment without them actually wanting to uh, make that change themselves. So as we know, the stages of change, uh, De Clemente, Proshka, people are often in pre-contemplation and then when they hit contemplation or determination, that's when they think about coming in for treatment or for help. And for every drug or substance use problem, at that stage, we want to discuss with them detoxification first. Uh, detox detoxification is a process of getting into treatment, but it, it is not an end all. And if we don't have a post detox plan, then we are planning to fail. So in that period, while we discuss and talk to patients through motivational interview, we need to also discuss their relapse prevention plan. And then we can start developing a detox plan as well. Next slide, please. So alcohol withdrawal symptoms can be mild, can be uh, moderate, can be complex. There are complex withdrawal uh, symptoms that may occur with alcohol. And this is one of the substances that also can be dangerous to life. There is a risk of mortality in people coming off alcohol, depending on the neuro adaptation and the amount that they consumed, and also their comorbidities, other medical problems that they may also experience as well. The common signs and symptoms, well, basically they are an increase in the sympathetic nervous system uh, function. And uh, so you'll have elevated blood pressure and tachycardia, body temperature, sweating, all these are the common uh, withdrawal symptoms of alcohol use. Next slide, please. I think this graph sort of describes it quite uh, efficiently in terms of duration and the types of different uh, alcohol withdrawals that we can anticipate or expect. Minor withdrawals may last for a few days, depending on you know, the amount that's consumed, the age of the person, the person and the comorbidities, but then there can be moderate to severe withdrawals. In the first 24 hours is when the, the risk for seizures is highest. And so we have to be really very careful because withdrawals would start about six to eight hours post last drink. And that period is when seizures may occur. The risk of death from seizures is about 10 to 20%. Uh, then in the third day or second or third day is when delirium tremens can occur. People who have had a seizure have a higher risk of developing delirium tremens. So knowing the different syndromes, uh, we can then plan the detoxification or the withdrawal treatment. 
Next slide, please. So in DT or delirium tremens, typically it occurs 48 to 72 hours after the last drink. And those risk factors include withdrawal seizures, as I mentioned, but also acute medical illnesses or abnormal liver function and older aged people as well. The symptoms include disorientation, confusion, uh, psychosis. Uh, they can be profuse sweating. Seizures may still occur during this period as well. And they can be autonomic nervous system uh, abnormalities as well as low-grade fever. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Oh, is it not moving? Uh, not yet, no. Stuck there. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, hang on. Are we moving? Uh, not yet, nope. <laughs> sorry, give me a second. Okay. No. Yep, good, okay. okay. Sorry about that. Now, the other complicated uh, withdrawal syndrome is actually Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. And this is largely due to the lack of thymine or B1. Uh, now, not identifying this early and not treating it or preventing it can actually lead to a permanent brain damage called Korsakoff psychosis. So some of the early warning signs of uh, Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome is Wernicke's uh, encephalopathy is really nystagmus or ophthalmoplegia, uh, ataxia, uh, unsteady gait, and confusion. And so the way to prevent it from actually occurring and prevent its progression is really giving parenteral time in, especially before administering glucose uh, because if we give glucose or IV glucose before we actually add time in, we're actually triggering off any case and cephalopathy as well. Next slide, please. Um, okay, I'm going to restart the slide. I'm sorry, Philip. Give me a okay. second. Yep. Okay. I just had a little bit of an issue with the slides. Oh, don't end the meeting for all, I hope. No. Oh, did, I, <laughs> did we do that? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, give me a second. I'm trying to figure this out. Um, we were okay earlier. Okay, new share. Here you go. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so now we come to eating withdrawals. Uh, so once people have decided that they want to address the alcohol use problem, we need to make a plan about the detoxification. And in people who may, you know, predictably have mild or minor withdrawals, home-based withdrawal treatment can be considered. As long as they have good supervision, that means they have support and somebody's going to monitor their medications and treatment. And they're going to maybe avoid all cues or triggers for relapse. Uh, and they must, of course, in their history, not have uh, complicated withdrawals in the past. The other common uh, withdrawal treatment option is outpatient uh, withdrawal treatment. And that means daily medical supervision. Medication dispensed daily. They're uh, you know, with, uh, monitoring done daily uh, through the phase of uh, withdrawals. And that's typically about five four to five days, maybe up to seven days as well. But in those who have history of high neuroadaptation, high alcohol use, and also past history of uh, complicated withdrawals or other medical comorbidities, it, may, it will be much better if they are regularly monitored as an inpatient and then uh, provided the treatment and medication for withdrawals then. Next slide, please. So during withdrawals, it's important to make assessments. The assessments are not just uh, biological, including laboratory tests and investigations. 
because there's going to be electrolyte imbalances, there's going to be changes in their kidney, liver function, uh, but also psychological. And so we can use assessment scales like the CIWA or the AWS, and that way we can sort of gauge the severity of their withdrawals as well. Next slide, please. So there are several different regimes that we can uh, typically use. The medication of choice, of course, is a long-acting benzodiazepine. Chlordiazepoxide is recommended in uh, most other countries. We don't have chlordiazepoxide in Malaysia, so we use the alternative, which is diazepam. And we can use that uh, in symptom-triggered therapy, where we use the scales to tell us when we uh, administer the medication. Uh, there are some compli I mean, there are some uh, difficulties with this because you need staff that are trained to be able to do appropriate assessments using these scales, using the CIWA or the AWS. Uh, so unless you're confident with the team actually doing that assessment, it may be better looking at a fixed schedule dose. Uh, fixed schedule therapy would be uh, diazepam given at a fixed dose and tapering. For example, maybe starting with uh, 40 milligrams to 60 milligrams a day and then tapering over the next four or five days. Uh, the other type of uh, regime is the loading dose regime. And this is especially for those that are expected to have complicated uh, withdrawals or who have had complicated withdrawals in the past. So those who have had seizures or delirium tremens in the past, we need to maybe look at tailored titrated doses in the early stages of up to about 20 milligrams of diazepam every two hours till they're you know, slightly somnolent and sleepy, and then move on to a fixed scheduled therapy or a symptom triggered therapy. Next slide, please. There are other regimes that uh, we also may resort to, uh, especially in patients with uh, liver damage. Uh, diazepam will then be, you know, uh, best substituted with lorazepam, a shorter acting benzodiazepine, uh, so that the risk of liver, uh, increased liver damage is reduced. Antipsychotics are usually only for behavioral symptoms and maybe psychosis, but we have to bear in mind the, the risk of seizures uh, using antipsychotics because they lower the seizure threshold. Uh, vitamins, as I mentioned earlier, thiamine is uh, essential in especially the first few days of withdrawal, but also other things like folic acid and B-complex and vitamin C. And sometimes it's recommended to a banana bag where you incorporate all these vitamins and minerals together and administer to the patient. The environment has to be appropriate, quiet, supportive environment with monitoring. And of course, fluids and electrolytes, magnesium has been shown to be a predictor for seizures and so we need to monitor magnesium levels and ensure that the magnesium level is adequate to prevent uh, complicated withdrawals as well and very often sodium and potassium will be deranged uh, and that needs to be monitored and adjusted as well next slide please okay well that's all for my presentation thank you for your attention okay um thank you very much philip uh, that was really really helpful I need to apologize uh, for the follow-ups and blips and blunders earlier. <laughs> I don't seem to be a good host and not doing this really too well. Um, but I think we got things back on track. Our next uh, uh, speaker will be, of course, Prof. Siva. Um, Prof. Siva, again, another very good friend as well. I, I'm looking at his CV and I'm trying to read as much of the important things as I can. Siva is the Deputy Head of uh, Education in uh, Monash. Um, he's also a qualified psychiatrist and associate prof uh, in psychiatry at Monash University, Malaysia, and a visiting consultant psychiatrist at Columbia Asia Hospital. He has been practicing in the field of clinical psychiatry for more than 19 years. An excellent teacher, trainer, um, specializes in motivational interviewing and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and he has excellent MI skills. I've seen him in action. If you have not, please go do so. Um, special interest in addiction medicine been doing this for more than 19 years, published extensively. Um, as, as, as a national trainer as well at the National Drug National Drug Substitution Therapy okay, program and running workshops in addiction counseling as well. 
Um, he's the current president of Intan Zone, an NGO in uh, HIV and harm reduction, servicing the most of the population, comprising of intravenous drugs, commercial sex workers, transitites, and homosexuals. Um, Prof. Siva will be talking to us uh, on the, the brain and addictions, basically, on the neuro imbalances. Um, Siva, you want to take over? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Prem. I, I thought you were about to say that uh, <laughs> inner in not using uh, skills or properties. <laughs> Maybe we can add that as well to your skills. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, um, uh, Philip basically opened up showing you the picture of alcohol and talking to you about what the current treatment uh, regime and protocols are. I'd be actually talking a little bit about uh, this, uh, the effect between brain and neurotransmitters and just, just a basic, simple understanding about why are things the way they are when you actually use uh, alcohol. You know, uh, uh, we actually started uh, understanding about alcohol and drugs, um, well, quite late, I would say. Um, um, let's say in the past 10, 20 years, uh, uh, then with research and with research output, we basically understood that it's no longer a habit. It's uh, more of a brain disease and you, the play of neurotransmitters. Now, guys, uh, what, what exactly are neurotransmitters? Now, these are just chemicals that you find in the brain. But, you know, I put up all these colorful things so showing you all the types of neurotransmitters which are involved with alcohol. And, uh, you know, if you can get the slides from frame, it'll be nice because it shows you what it actually does. Like, for example, uh, the one in pink, dopamine. Dopamine basically gives you a good feeling. It's the pleasure feeling that you get. Serotonin is basically something that helps you with mood. It makes you feel good. So it's like a ha happy uh, chemical. Like um, It also acts on GABA. So what alcohol actually does is it basically acts on GABA and it slows you down. And that's, that's the effect that you actually see when you drink alcohol, you find that things slow down, you're more relaxed, you know, you're, you're, you're more chill. Uh, but, you know, as all these good feelings or good sort of symptoms come in, it also does negative things. Like, for example, it works on the glutamate, the one in blue. And what it does is it slows down learning. It slows down memory. And it also affects acetylcholine. So it has hampering effects on memory. So you find that there's a whole range of neurotransmitters that actually get released whenever you take alcohol. So you're feeling good when you take it, you know, but many of you wake up the next day feeling really down, really bad, you know, with a headache. Now, why, why, why does that happen? It all depends on the alcohol, the pinches that you take, you know. Now, just imagine that we are looking at a, a production factory. So if you find the neurotransmitters are produced in a factory. And if the release of the neurotransmitters surplus or is exceeds the production, you find that when you take alcohol, a lot of the neurotransmitters get released. And the next day, your production hasn't gone on and you're, you're, you're left with a reduced amount of neurotransmitters. So when your dopamine is down and your serotonin is down, you're going to feel down. And people who chronically use alcohol, you find that these changes can actually go on on a more permanent basis. Let's move on to the next slide, Prim. Ah, okay. So it's a, it's a very pictor, a pic, a pictorial uh, view of what effects you get by taking alcohol. Now, it all depends where alcohol acts and how it acts. So... It shows you very simple, in very simple way, how it basically acts. Like, for example, the cerebral cortex. Okay, the cerebral cortex is basically that main area. It's most probably the, what you call as the executive function of the brain. So you find that when alcohol acts there, it gives you a very alert feeling. You find that uh, your decision making, your assessment of things basically go down. Uh, it can also act on the hypo campus, or sorry, the hippocampus. The hippocampus deals a lot with uh, memory and you find that people tend to forget a lot. Now, this is all short-term, guys, okay? The hypothalamus, now, the hypothalamus works a lot on the control of the body's temperature, the heart rate, so you find that that gets disturbed too. It can act on the central nervous system and the medulla. It helps with balance, so the medulla is one of the important places where it actually helps with balance. And you find that 
whenever alcohol acts on the, the central nervous system and the medulla, people get a problem of imbalance uh, together with the cerebellum. All right. So you find that these are short-term effects of alcohol. But uh, mind you that alcohol on a chronic basis has also long-term effects. Let's see some of the long-term effects. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, this study which was published in 2003 looked into uh, young alcohol uh, users compared to the older ones. And amazingly, what they found was, if you actually look at the first graph, um, it shows that there is definitely a decrease in cortical tissue or brain tissue when you compare the older drinkers to the younger ones showing that the older drinkers have got lesser brain tissue in certain areas. And when you look at that yellow graph uh, uh, in that first uh, diagram, you find that it is more pronounced in the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex is basically right in front here. And that's the executive function of the brain. And that understands or it explains reasons why people who, who drink chronically have got issues with making judgments, uh, aggressive behavior, uh, those kind of things. We find that the prefrontal cortex is also very vulnerable to alcohol's effect, especially in the older alcoholics. Um, in terms of uh, responsiveness, you find that the alcoholics, that is the next two graphs, basically have got a less response in, the, in terms of brain function compared to the ones who are younger or even controls who have never taken alcohol before. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now, why is that so and what happens? So let's take a few steps back into adolescence and, and look at adolescent drinkers. Now, uh, AIE is basically adolescent intermittent alcohol. Now, there's always a saying that, you know, uh, to stop the effects of alcohol, you stop them right from young. You don't start on it, that's the safest. And why does that happen? Because there have been enough evidence showing that when you start young as an adolescent, it actually affects the serotonin fibers or neurons. And it can actually cause some amount of permanent damage. So much so that when you start young, the damage that is done as a youngster is brought on to adulthood and it makes a person or, or increases a person's uh, uh, chances of self-administering uh, alcohol as an adult. And that's been actually proven through uh, research. Next, please. Yeah. Now, this is uh, my last slide. Uh, and um, Philip actually showed you about uh, how alcohol use has actually changed during uh, the isolation period. Um, so the question is, has social deprivation changed neurotransmitters? And the question and the answer is yes, actually. Uh, people find it quite surprisingly, but you know, these are basically research done in rats. What they actually learned is, uh, through research uh, on rat brains, it's found that whenever a rat in, in an in a, uh, investigative setting is deprived of social stimuli, the rat brain or the red adolescent brain actually gets enhanced in terms of synaptic plasticity. Now, what, what is that? Synaptic plasticity is the ability of the brain to actually recover from uh, injuries or effects. And, and that's how actually basically after an alcohol, you're bas a binge, you know, you're basically recovering. But what it also does is when there's a lot of plasticity going on, it's called metaplasticity. It works on a chemical called NMDA and it primes your brain towards the substance. So research has actually done, uh, been done in rats who are deprived socially in terms of using alcohol and MEP-M. And they found that uh, the brains of the rats get primed to alcohol, making, uh, and it gets primed to a certain extent where you know, it's resistant to extinction. That means even if there is no alcohol, it stays on. And, what changes does it actually bring about? It actually makes the red vulnerable to another pinch of alcohol. So in short, what it basically says, if you, trans, if you transfer that knowledge that you get from, uh, from red research brain to human, it shows that in social deprivation, there are changes. There are changes that takes place in neurotransmitters 
and to the brain, making the brain more vulnerable to alcohol. And that's the reason most probably why we are looking at an increased rate of alcohol intake, or we are looking at an increased rate of new alcohol users, and also, of course, uh, relapses among people who were already uh, in remission. So that's basically a small uh, explanation about how neurotransmitters work on brain. So just putting some practical experience into understanding through research. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Deva. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. Um, I, I, I next presenter we have is uh, Dr. Paramis. And I understand there are quite a few questions coming in. Um, guys, if you can just hold on to the questions till the end of the talk, you know, we'll be very happy to address them. Um, Dr. Paramiswaran, a friend of mine, again, we're all buddies, all very good friends. <laughs> Param is uh, currently head of psychiatry and uh, mental health unit in Hospital Kongkwampuan in Kuala Pila. He's also a visiting consultant for addiction services in uh, Sramban GH as well. Um, graduated with an MBBS. Masters in Psychological Medicine in 2002 and Fellowship in Addiction Medicine um, and Addiction Psychiatry 2009. He's also, Param is also an honorary senior lecturer for undergraduates and postgraduates of psychiatry at, in uh, IMU, International Medical University, and uh, UM as well, University of Malaya. And uh, Param is a trainer for Fellowship in Addiction Psychiatry for MOH, Ministry of Health. He was the head of addiction psychiatry services in MOH as well from 2010 to 2019. That's a long time. Um, Dr. Paramis. Thanks, uh, Karim. Um, uh, the slides are still. Yeah, sorry. I, 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 I think we, I need to move your slides. Yeah, sorry. Here you go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Prem. Okay. So my topic is a bit more interesting uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, these are common things you see. Understanding triggers, urges, and craving in recovery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, see, the, the thing is that we, have, we use this word urges, craving. Uh, most of the people who are drug dependent or alcohol dependent, they go through this. And uh, even they go through it, even after stopping it, they still have this craving and urges. So the question is, what is this craving and urges? It is very difficult to differentiate because uh, it is a broad range of uh, thoughts physical sensation, emotion is uh, associated with it. But craving as such, you can say it's a desire, a desire to drink, okay? But it doesn't need that, uh, it doesn't mean that it has to have a drink, but in the sense that it is just a desire, sometimes they find it difficult to control. The urges, on the other hand, is the feeling, the tension uh, associated with it, uh, the restlessness, the agitation, and it is fulfilled when they drink and they feel the fulfillment. So this is a visual cycle which they go through. Next, Prince. So saying um, triggers, basically craving can uh, trigger due to various other reasons. Uh, there are basically uh, two types of triggers. You can categorize it as an internal and an external uh, triggers. The external triggers are like, you know, the people uh, whom they drink with, uh, the places, the pubs they go to, or the things or even they like Friday, the, the happy hour, they go for drinking. So all this is like a reminder for them that uh, they need to have, uh, to have a drink. And this will uh, trigger the craving and this makes them to go back to drinking. Similarly, the internal triggers, uh, this can pop up suddenly out of no reason. But sometimes it's just a fleeting thought. Uh, it has a positive and negative emotion attached to it, you know, when they're happy, when they're sad. So these are all the internal triggers which uh, lead them to drink. At the same time, if you talk about craving, craving is, is multifaceted. He has a physical, mental, emotional component. As compared to triggers, triggers are very specific. Uh, uh, and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like you know, people, places, and things like that. But that doesn't mean that each time they see, they will, uh, they will, uh, uh, they will have the craving. So by controlling the triggers, that's how you control your craving. Uh, next slide. So. The problem with this uh, relapse due to triggers, there's a lot of myths. Normally, we will say that, you know, uh, it is because of uh, character defect, uh, uh, immorality, or selfishness. That's why they continue drinking. But as what uh, Siva mentioned earlier, that there's a lot more things happening in your brain. There's more biological rather than just the psychological uh, or maybe it's just behavioral. Um, 
But there's, there are some common facts why people relapse, why they go back to alcohol uh, or drugs for their sake. Okay. One of it is they always think that, you know, by ignoring, suppressing the craving, they think that they will be uh, able to control, like, you know, willpower. If my willpower is strong, I can control it. But that really doesn't work. And people who are sober, who have stopped drinking, uh, normally, because of these triggers, they go back to uh, destructive behavior. Just like the picture on the uh, right-hand side, you can see that, you know, the uh, yellow circle, that's a trigger, which is small. You can control it. Once it becomes big, and then your craving is intensifying, you have no control over it. That's when they go back to uh, drinking. Some people might drink for a few days, uh, even though they have stopped for years. So these are the risk factors that therefore controlling triggers is very important. At the same time, uh, understanding triggers and coming up with strategies how to overcome it would be helpful to deal with uh, triggers, craving as well as urges. Uh, next slide. Okay, so these are some of the common uh, triggers which uh, leads to uh, relapse. Okay, one of the most commonest is uh, withdrawal symptoms when a person goes to withdrawal and Definitely when he drinks alcohol, he feels better. So when you're withdrawal, if you ask him to just stop drinking, he's going to struggle. This is where uh, Dr. Philip uh, was mentioning that, you know, there are medications to help to deal with the withdrawals. You know, the detox and so forth will be helpful to control them. The other, the second one is the emotional distress. Some of them, they have a, a negative or positive emotion, which leads to uh, drinking alcohol because they are unable to uh, co control or cope with the emotion. And their methods of coping is usually drinking, so therefore uh, they are not able to control that. The uh, third one is uh, underlying mental illness, or uh, maybe they have depression, underlying depression or physical illness like pain. These are uh, also a common triggers for relapse for alcohol. Peer pressures, which is very common, especially when you uh, go out with friends and you say that you stop drinking, and the friend says, "Want to have one last drink?" And that's how it goes on. Uh, relationship, especially they have a marital discord, things like that. So their way of expressing, they might not be able to tell other other members of family. So he keeps himself. The only way he self uh, treat is perhaps going back to his alcohol uh, drinking. Sometimes traumas, the childhood traumas, uh, like PTSDs, and they end up, especially like war war veterans. You can see they end up uh, drinking a lot because of to to control their emotions. Um, Number five is very surprising. Uh, increase in monetary resources, especially when they have a lot of money in the pocket or when they have some uh, extra cash in the pocket. And this is also a risk factor. So these are some, uh, some uh, factors which can trigger them to, to, to going back to alcohol. Uh, similarly, like uh, positive and negative life events, uh, uh, some uh, close member passed, uh, a member of family passed away, or maybe he has a promotion that stresses him out or he is enjoying himself because he had a promotion, he'll go back to drinking alcohol. Uh, number six is testing boundaries. Sometimes they have stopped drinking for quite some time and they say that, you know, okay, I have stopped drinking for so long. I think I, I deserve it. I can have a drink. I think I can control it now. And that's when it uh, spirals down. Sometimes overconfident, they say that, you know, okay, just one drink is not going to make a difference. And that end up uh, two or third and fourth and so forth. Certain high risk situation, especially when they are hungry, when they're angry, lonely, tired. So they have specific situation for individuals where they need to avoid. Life stressors, uh, especially day-to-day uh, -day life stresses or maybe there's some uh, ma major life events which could have contributed. Stress is one of the most commonest cause for relapse. You know, financial problems, problems with the marital issues and so forth. It's one of the commonest uh, results. Just like in uh, currently with the MCOs, there's a lot of stress. And this also can trigger to drinking alcohol, especially if they are, uh, they are, uh, their way of coping is drinking and, uh, and feeling lonely. There's no one to talk to and things like that. They end up drinking alcohol. Catastrophic life events also can cause that. And lastly, is staying sober is a long-term uh, challenge and long-term commitments. A lot of people will just uh, stop drinking for maybe a week or two and then they feel that they're, they're in control. So this has to be longer, maybe a year, uh, one or two years, if you think that you are really in control, then perhaps you can see some results. Next. Uh, okay, so these are some of the tips how to handle uh, uh, just, okay, I'll go too fast because I think uh, we, we are running short of the time. 
So basically, you need to plan ahead. Uh, you need to know your triggers, track and analyze the triggers. And sometimes the triggers may, may be very mild. You can just control them, say that, you know, this is not an issue or distract yourself, okay? If, if you are in a situation where you know that you will drink, you know, going to a pub and saying that, you know, I can control myself, that's not going to happen. So basically, avoiding is the best. So therefore, you can control it. Next slide. So to, to have a, a clear view of how you want to avoid cope, uh, coping approach, so other things you can do is you learn how to cope with the triggers. So you need to have strategies. So situation, different situations, you need to have strategies. Remind yourself uh, the reason why you are making this change for medical reason, for personal reason, for family, and so forth. Um, talking, uh, uh, talk it through to someone, especially like, you know, if you're an alcoholic anonymous, you have sponsors, but uh, if you have your close family members, you can talk to them. Distract yourself is the best way of doing it. And the next few slides, I'll just quickly mention about way to distract. Challenges, um, yeah. So distracting, uh, there is, uh, this 3D is very interesting. Um, most craving will pass off in uh, 20 minutes, okay, during this period. So this is where they need to surf in, uh, with your uh, urges and cravings. So one of the ways is uh, distracting uh, some, themselves, when asking, taking their mind off um, or talking to someone and doing something. Decision making, so they need to look back why, they, why it's important for them to stop and uh, analyze that and then uh, reassure them that, you know, I sh should continue stopping. Uh, destruction is another way, a uh, good idea so to have some strategies, uh, ready-made strategies to deal with it will be good, very good. Next slide. Yeah, these are some of it. So some of you would have tried this, you know, like listening to music or maybe going for a walk, uh, exercise, uh, having a picking up a hobby. But these are things which cannot be done during your MCO. So there's a lot of limitation during MCO. So this is where maybe some of them have problems and uh, they're not able to go out, they're not able to exercise which will help them before. Now they're trapped in the house and uh, maybe they have, are having marital discord. So they cannot meet up their friends. Maybe the, this, this can contribute to, to increase in alcohol consumption. But saying that there are other things can be done. You can uh, be creative, do some activity with the family, start cooking, making uh, new dishes or uh, playing computers, learning how to use computers and uh, you know, go through your Zoom, uh, through your media, uh, communicate with your friends. So these are other ways that it can be done. Uh, I think this is my last slide, Prem. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Back to you, Prem. Okay. Thank you, um, Param. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's actually my turn now to share, and I'm going to quickly run back to my slides. Um, okay. So that's me. Uh, now yeah. I need to talk about myself. This is strange. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so my name is uh, Prem Kumar Shanmugam. And uh, I'm from Solace, as you can see all over my back. I, I think I've got some Solace in my face also. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm the CEO and clinical director in Solace. Solace is an addiction treatment retreat. We started in 2014 in Malaysia, and uh, we're now in Kuala Lumpur. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the psychosocial aspects and um, how the, the pandemic and the, as it has affected the psychosocial relationship between addictions and managing this current situation. Now, you may have noticed that we, the other three panelists were all psychiatrists. So they were coming from a very specific uh, area, especially Prof. Siva and Prof. Uh, Philip. I think Param and I are focusing more into the psychological and the psychosocial aspects of uh, substance misuse or addictions. Um, this is a bit more, not so specific to alcohol itself, but we're moving into something more general. Um, what has happened recently as a result of this pandemic? People with alcohol use disorders and alcohol liver disorders seem to be at a higher risk, um, mainly because they're unable to seek treatment due to the pandemic and due to the lockdown. Uh, lots of social distancing. They have to stay away. They have to stay locked up. We have all experienced some level of uh, trauma recently you know, as a result of being locked up. Um, maybe later, if we have a chance, I, I, Philip and I recently managed a case together. Um, and that's someone who suffered from alcohol abuse, alcohol misuse, and as a result of the lockdown, he had bad liver issues. And uh, he's well today; he's being discharged, and you know he's well. But uh, it was quite an experience. Um, 
one big problem or difficulty that people with addictions have is structure. Now, addiction itself we find is a structure by itself. Finding the drugs or the alcohol, getting high from it, and then withdrawing from it, and then after that, looking for it again. It takes up a lot of time and it actually builds a structure in a person's life. Now with the lockdown or with the isolation and without a proper routine, it's so difficult because you go back to your drinking already. There's, there's nothing else to do. So relapses are very high. Now, as I think Philip shared earlier, we're not too sure about the statistics of alcohol relapses, but um, from a treatment perspective in Solace, off recently, I think the last two weeks, we've been seeing an increase in uh, alcohol-related relapses and withdrawals. Another big problem that people in recovery faced during the lockdown was this inability to attend support group meetings. The support group meetings were all online, but um, there's always that social interaction in meeting, uh, uh, community meetings that are very helpful. Um, depression has kicked in. I think we all know that um, everywhere as a result of various psychosocial factors, uh, financial issues, relationship issues, which we'll go through in a little while. And uh, of course, those with alcohol use disorder seem to be at higher risk of financial stresses, stresses because under normal circumstances, they struggle to get a job or, or hold on to a career. What more now when financial stresses kick in? It's so difficult to even have a job. Right? An interesting uh, thing that's happening now is Zoom happy hours. Uh, I, I was uh, at a dinner at my sister's place uh, about a month ago and I heard my brother-in-law speaking, cheers, saying cheers, cheers, you know, in the room. And I was like, hey, how can you guys have a party? And then I realized they were having a party through Zoom and people were drinking. And uh, they were happy. It's okay. There was social distancing. But Zoom happy hours have started now. Boozing at home or drinking at home seems to be becoming uh, part of the new norm, I suppose. You know, people are, are, are enjoying that isolating and drinking. Uh, there's alcohol named after COVID, I understand, in the States. Because then this thing with media, a lot of information in media, which we're going to talk about in the next slide, and how the media has influenced our perception. Um, one of the talks that I, was, I had opportunity to do with in a colleague about a month ago, he said something very interesting. He said, a good friend of mine, he said, you know, every day we talk about the problems, we talk about the people that are dying, we talk about the people that are falling sick, but where are the reports on people who are getting better and where are the reports about people who are getting well? Uh, we didn't talk much, enough about that. Then as Philip was saying earlier, uh, liquor sales have gone up. Yeah, there's definitely 300%, apparently there's a 300% hike in liquor sales. Um, what is happening now seems to be what had happened after the stock market crash in 87 and the financial crisis. Similar trend, people turning to alcohol and uh, not specifically alcohol alone. Of course, other substances are being abused as well. Um, happy hours have been extended. Uh, we have a clinic um, in the Publica where you know, many of you know there are lots of pubs there and cafes there. So when the MCO was lifted and I went back to work, and uh, I thought the pubs would be closed. But now they open earlier, by the way. They're opening up at uh, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., and uh, happy hours have been extended. So in a way, we seem to be encouraging more people to drink or more people to come out. And I must say, I'm looking at more youngsters now. Um, youngsters, the same pubs which I used to observe, uh, drinking holes. Now I see more youngsters. Maybe it's because of the youngsters uh, want a high at higher. You know they are more impulsive. They are more risk-taking behavior, um, and that's why they are coming out openly and beginning to drink. Like that I don't know. Okay, so what is the psychosocial relationship that is happening between the COVID itself as a disease, the healthcare providers, the government? And of course, the media. There seems to be something that's um, remarkable that's happening. Um, the SARS outbreak in 2003, you know, we, after 2003, apparently the impact of that outbreak was even seen years after that. Um, stigmatization, that's one big problem. Healthcare providers mainly, um, those who are more exposed to the disease itself, they seem to, some of them were being stigmatized. Uh, a study was done in Taiwan and um, they found that uh, nurses suffering more from depression, higher rate of nurses who were working in the field suffering from depression. 
um, we or may, we are also seem to be affected very much by stigmatization as a result of the media. You know, we're talking about um, people to stay away from, people to accuse. You know, it's your fault. That's why it's spreading. Um, the media has affected us a lot. Infodemic, um, a psychosocial burden of quarantine and isolation that has caused a lot of uh, stresses. Um, people are becoming more obsessive. I go out for dinner with friends and I see them obsessively washing their spoons and their cutlery in hot water or changing their masks every 10 to 15 minutes, you know, thinking that this mask is no good. Um, sanitizers. There are so many types of sanitizers going around now. People are obsessively washing their hands, thinking the germs may spread. Um, first time I saw friends after a long time, they're saying, hey, stay far away, don't come near me, don't spread, don't come near me. You know? So there's lots of uh, obsessive thinking that is going on as well. Um, sorry. And then, of course, workplace prejudice. Yesterday I was watching the news and I understand that uh, the government will take serious action on uh, people who are not compliant. And um, the way we sit in the office, the way we function, the way we operate, the way we talk to each other, everything is changing. Of course, now we call it the new norm. Right? Um, various people are affected as a result. The healthcare providers, there's this thing, the sense of fear of worthlessness. Am I doing enough? Am I doing, uh, am I efficient enough? There's guilt and the loss of life. When people die. Work stress pressure, obviously. Many people are struggling there. Um, I think another important factor is deprived from home, family. You know, they go back home and they can't be with their loved ones. They spend so much of time at the hospital. And there's the ability or the possibility of substance abuse. More people are turning to alcohol and drugs to numb their pain and emotion. It seems to be the fastest way to numb pain uh, with drugs. Children, I think one of the biggest difficulty, maybe not difficulty, they enjoyed not going to school, but uh, boredom at home during the whole pandemic, staying at home and trying to ful fulfill their time. There were schools that had online classes, but not all schools. And then there was that anxiety, what's going to happen? How, do I gonna, how am I going to catch up? Not only with children, but also with the parents, I think. Uh, children became more irritable. Um, I, a lack of uh, education on the disease itself, that affected children. Parents became struggled to keep their children, to maintain the children at home and, and keep them occupied. Um, the old age population, one of the biggest difficulties with them were inability to assess the doctor's um, medication. You know, they couldn't get their medication on time. During the lockdown, especially during the lockdown, I think most clinics had to close and patients were ordering their medication back home. Um, of course, the marginalized community, they struggled quite a bit. Financial insecurity, joblessness. Um, there were a lot of health crime as well. We know that depression. But the good thing that came out also is that many people started coming together and you see lots of acts of altruism happening, which is wonderful. You know, people were, were getting together, donating food, going out and helping those in need who were jobless. Um, I know friends of mine who got together and put money and started buying, you know, food and, and delivering them to the, uh, some of the places where people were jobless and struggling. So that was something really wonderful. For the psychiatric patients, again, inability to, for checkups, to get their medication. Um, violence, because they were relapsing, the mental health disorders were relapsing and many turned to addiction. We know during the pandemic, there was this um, roti ganja that we heard, you know, uh, grab food or sorry, food delivery people were delivering food with drugs in them. People still had to continue with their drugs. Different parts of the society were struggling. Now, what about family? How did the family cope? What was happening at home? Now, there's an estimated 100 million people around the world who struggle, families who struggle as a result of a loved one to the addiction. Each person can cause two to 10 people around them to be affected as a result of the addiction. In countries like Malaysia, where we have extended families, of course, the numbers are higher. All these Asian countries, or maybe even Asian countries, we live a very um, collectivistic system. So, you know, we extended families and the relationships are more complicated as compared to individualistic societies. Family influences socializing to adjust the social demands. The way we communicate with each other, the way we talk to each other, this influences the way we socialize with the outside world as well. It all starts from home. 
um, early antisocial behavior predictor of substance misuse. I think uh, Shiva touched on this earlier about the adolescent brain, child brain, a younger person's brain, how it, how what happens to the brain as they grow up. Uh, the most strongest predictor at home would be parental substance abuse or substance use modeling. Um, we have seen families. I remember a case where the girl was uh, abusing substances a lot and we found out that she had witnessed a mother injecting heroin and she you know, copied the same behavior. So I won't go into too detail about uh, this model here, about family relations and structure. Um, it's, it's, it's the way families function. But what has happened as a result of this whole, maybe um, not specifically the pandemic alone, but families that have dysfunction, that are dysfunctional for whatever reason, whether it's an addiction problem or, or social economic problem or psychosocial problem, generally the family's structure shifts. Okay? Now families, as we know, function as a structure, as a unit, as a unit, and they have their own roles, they have their own systems at play. But when there's a dysfunction or a virus that affects, whether it's the COVID-19 or it's this um, addiction, the structures, the roles shift, and each family member tend to take on different roles. Now, as a result of the roles that family members take on, instead of helping to solve the virus or treat the virus, what happens is they can actually help to condition the disease or the virus from getting worse. Okay, so this picture here, what we are seeing is a typical family. Now, the victim here is the chemical dependent or the person who's got an addiction problem. He's got lots of shame, guilt, fear, pain, hurt, but how does he do it? How does he manage it? Hostile, blames, manipulative, substances. And he takes on a victim's role. Then there'll be one person who takes on the family hero role. And you see this, it could be the, one of the children, it could be the siblings, it could be an adult who starts to become the family hero and starts to become you know, a high achiever very successful, either successful at school, at college, or in life, you know, in career. Um, but inside, you know, this person feels lots of guilt and hurt. Then you see another mascot popping up. Um, this person is the one who's going clowning around. He goes around clowning around and trying to attract the attention away from the problem, away from the, 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 the problem of the family into himself. Then you have an enabler. Enabler is someone who becomes reasonably codependent with the victim. Um, starts to, well, generally they do not care for themselves. Instead, they become obsessed with the victim and they start to overcare for the victim. Um, they can appear to be very self righteous. They can appear to be overly responsible, um, sarcastic, passive. Um, inside, they are actually suffering in pain and lots of self neglect. They don't take care of their needs. There's a lost child, that's another character that surfaces. The lost child is the person who is like forgotten, you know, the one that's left out as a result of the focus on the on the victim. Sometimes there's a scapegoat as well. So the one that you blame, the problem child, the one that's constantly being blamed and the one that is left out. So why do these roles surface? Why do these roles suddenly pop up? Now, what, a way to understand it, maybe within the Asian culture, when addictions or when there's a dysfunction, what happens is shame, guilt, hurt affects the family as a whole. But when it's shame and guilt and hurt, the family shut down um, because they, they don't want to share this. They don't want the neighbors to know. They don't want relatives to know. When they shut down, in order to protect each other, these various roles start to surface. And they think they're protecting each other. What's happening is they're actually protecting the virus or the addiction to actually continue. They're conditioning the wrong behavior. So when we treat, we remove the sick person and we start to treat the sick person. Very often, we forget to treat the family as a unit. And this is extremely important because the family, if left untreated, and we treat this one person, it goes back to an untreated environment. We left us behind. This, there's a very uh, strong psychosocial relationships that happen within the family as well. Pretty much similar to what's happening outside with the society, with the community. community. The new norm that is taking place or the shift that is taking place now as a result of the pandemic will see various roles within the community coming up surfacing and we need to treat that as a whole pretty much like how we treat the family um, if not you know it's just treating the covid alone is the solution 
exactly how we work with substance dependence or substance um, addictions. Um, that's the end of my slide. I'm, I'm going to end here. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the slide. Okay. So, um, right. We've got, um, so, so guys, you all want to share anything before we move on to the questions? Sorry. I think we can go on with the questions. Is everyone okay? Okay. Yep. Thank you all very much. It's exactly one hour now as we planned. I know there were some hiccups in between. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. I understand that uh, there was a problem with the link on Facebook as well. Um, I'm not sure what happened. I'm sorry. We will play the recording. Yeah, for those who have missed this, we have a recording. So we will definitely send it to all of you. Now, one of the questions that came in earlier was about detox. Um, maybe, uh, Philip, you want, to, you want to, is it okay with you? Yeah, sure. Okay. So basically, this question is about detox protocol. And uh, what, how would you like, would you like to share anything about uh, detox tip, treatment improvement protocol? Is there anything specific that we, like, we can know about alcohol for detox protocol? Well, I mean, basically with uh, detox, I mean, the protocol varies from place to place. The most important thing is it's a biopsychosocial approach. And so from the beginning itself, assessment is important to understand where the patient is standing in terms of motivation to change and then deciding a date and period for their detox, which I mentioned earlier can be as, you know, home supported detox, uh, outpatient supported or inpatient. Uh, and that will be determined by the assessment that's done earlier on the, you know, what anticipated uh, withdrawals are expected or uh, concomitant other illnesses as well. And then the mainstay of treatment is basically benzodiazepines, long-acting, usually diazepam, unless there's liver damage, and uh, then time in. Uh, and then, of course, the supportive, uh, you know, the... Uh, supportive ter therapies and treatments. So rehydration and, you know, managing all the other concomitant uh, medical illnesses as well. Uh, ideally, it's best managed uh, if it's in a hospital setting together with a physician. So physician and addiction medicine specialist together managing the detox period because we want to avoid the complicated withdrawals. Okay. Um, okay. Thank Brian, you. Can I add on something please. on it? Yeah, uh, yeah. So basically, like what uh, Philip was saying, that in the Philip's, uh, Philip's uh, slide, you could see also stages of change. So there should be some amount of readiness of change for them to go to detox. Because if you, if you, uh, a person who's not ready, if you force him in a detox, the chances of him going back to uh, drinking alcohol will be very high. Or if he has a medical condition where you need to have to do an emergency detox, then that's a different uh, story altogether. But then uh, an assessment of readiness change would help you to kind of determine what type of detox he needs. Okay. Um, maybe I, I... Sorry, Philip, you're going to say something. No, uh, no I, I think Param is absolutely right. There's sometimes when we are forced to do detox, uh, patients are not ready. Uh, we are called... In then because they're actually for another medical issue. Uh, we can't give alcohol in hospital settings. It's unethical. So we will have to treat their withdrawals during that period with the normal detox protocol. But then it's an opportunity for us to discuss about motivation to change. You know, so we use that opportunity to say, okay, well, once your medical problem is resolved, you may want to then consider, you know, looking at uh, coming in for treatment and you know, relapse prevention and all the others that we can incorporate. Okay. Um, actually, I, I, a question comes to my mind now, just to add to this, um, to throw a spanner in the wheel, actually. Um, no, some, very often, I think we see patients coming for treatment, looking at the stages of change. If they come at the right stage, motivated, it's easy for us to work with them. It's easy for us to treat them. What about patients who are not motivated? What about patients who don't think they have a problem and the family bring them for treatment? 
so yeah uh, can i go first please yeah 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 so basically what i do in my day to day practice is if the person is not let's say is a alcoholic they diagnosed to have alcoholic is in pre contemplation is not ready to change uh, i would not i would explain to him what are the other uh, methods of interventions available what is that can be done and things like that one of the most important thing i do with him is okay so let us observe what is your drinking pattern for this past uh, next one month so or two weeks this kind of i put him on a drink diary uh, drinking mm-hmm. diary and then we will observe and then we will say that okay can you cut down or uh, things are like that the, the, there are times where he goes out of control or there are times where he uh, involved in high risk behavior like drink driving and things are like that then i'll show them that you see you say that you are in control you say that it's not a issue but then these are things you are doing then maybe perhaps he's the acceptance to some extent that uh, that acceptance will come in by by showing evidence that you know he has uh, he has done something which could have harmed him or harm his family or affect his work going way, uh, late to work kind of thing which is related to alcohol so perhaps with that maybe we are creating a bit of discrepancy in him so for him to move forward in the stages of change mm. yeah yeah prem uh, if i can say a bit i think uh, you you brought up a very uh, important thing that's one of the things that uh, many of uh, many therapists fail to to check uh the stages of change um uh, it's very important for therapists to actually make that uh, decision in which stage of change they are because uh there are some things that you should not say in certain change uh, in certain uh, stages yeah. if you find someone who i mean like your the, the example you gave prem uh, appears like he's in pre contemplation yeah. now there's no point of actually sitting down with a guy in pre contemplation and talking to him uh, about steps and what to do and all those things because he's basically not thought about it at all so yeah. just like what param says bringing up those doubts uh looking at uh, reasons why he drinks and reason why he uh, uh advantages and disadvantages of drinking you know as people move then when they go on to a contemplation stage then it's good to bring in something called a, a decisional balance mm. where they basically can put in points uh, why they are drinking and points why they are coming in today you know those points uh, for and against we use a lot of things in mi call uh uh the ruler motivational ruler right. and other things so those are some skills that uh people can use but very important to gauge where people are yeah. the first time they step into your clinic mm-hmm. yeah i completely agree i think i want to add also that you know as addiction therapists the, one of the most important things that we should always consider is harm reduction mm. you know so even if people are not motivated to change their pre contemplation we have a very important role to look at harm reduction you know, so that also helps us build rapport and relationship and that's one of the biggest predictors for motivation to change you know once you build a relationship with the client they think okay well when i'm ready i know who to see you know yeah. so I, i mean those are the areas that we focus on if a person is in pre contemplation we don't discard them throw them away i mean we actually discuss with them you know how to prevent harm and you know tell them that we're there when they are ready to change and we want to help them as well mm. i i have to agree because um sometimes you know we 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 try to over help which can happen in in therapy right we we try to overdo it we, we become codependent to a certain extent and uh, we try to force people into treatment and that's not going to be helpful if that relationship is there the trust is there they will come back it's just a matter of time don't know where to go but but uh, what comes to my mind is another question what about if the patient is uh doesn't even see he has a problem for example he's psychotic right he's abusing um, some stimulant and uh, i don't need i i can stop i don't need treatment i'm fine but he's hearing voices you know so at that point of time sometimes i think we may need to consider some mandated form of treatment to get him into the hospital or something yeah okay uh i think an- another thing that siva you mentioned about motivational interviewing that we use quite often in therapy is uh, rolling with the resistance especially in uh, pre contemplation or even in contemplation um in therapy our job is to try and move them from one stage to the next stage to the next stage yeah. and if we don't know what stage they are at when they come in it's going to be very difficult huh? okay um i i have i'm looking at my phone for the questions <laughs> okay so i think this one uh for siva this should be more um uh for you okay so it's about the young adolescent brain So based on your experience and based on neuro imbalances is it easier to treat the younger people or the older people and second one is is it 
better for treatment to get for people to get into treatment when they're younger or when they're older? Oh, interesting question. Um, well, um, I, I I would say honestly, uh, when when you compare the uh, the teenagers and the el uh, older people, um, um, you, you have more challenges. Uh, uh, when you deal with teenagers because there's so multiple other issues that actually come into play. But remember, I mean, you know, motivation is motivation. So whether you're a teenage, uh, uh, whether you're in your teenage years or whether you are an uh, older, more experienced drinker, you know, uh, it basically comes in. Now, um, what are the, the basic challenges that we actually have, uh, which, which adds on in, in the teenage years is one, uh, you know, the brain still develops. So when we're looking at a very young uh, uh, drinker, mm. the decision or the uh, capability to actually make judgments and to make decisions is, is basically expected to be lesser when uh, you're de dealing with, with, with teenagers. Uh, why is it so important to actually make a stop then as a teenager? Is, uh, as a teenager yeah. is, you find that, you know, uh, the, the longer you allow drugs, I'm not just talking about uh, alcohol, but we're talking about other drugs. The, the longer you take, uh, you allow drugs to actually play with the, uh, the brain or to be there in, in, in a person, it actually has a higher propensity to cause uh, certain long-standing changes. Long-standing changes in, in deeper areas of the brain, uh, the neurons and uh, the uh, other areas, which, which basically can make a person more prone for addiction at a later stage. So why is it actually more important to actually target that earlier mm. compared to an older age. Mm. Okay. I think you also mentioned that earlier in your slide about uh, plasticity, uh, metaplasticity and neuroplasticity, which was very clear. It made a lot of sense. Uh, another problem with working with youngsters is the fact that they're highly impulsive, right? They're high risk taking behavior. Um, but you, you have an uh, advantage in younger people because very often they are dependent. So mm. you can set boundaries. I mean, that becomes the role of the family. Mm. You know, instead of becoming the enabler, they set boundaries and they put things in place and then the dependent then has to follow suit until they become at an age where they can make decisions for themselves. You know, so there are, you know, things that we can incorporate in the family process as well. Mm. In fact, so, sometimes when we work with families, um, the, the thing that I like to ask, encourage the family to say is, you know, um, I love you very much. I love you dearly. I care for you very much, but I can't, and I can't allow you to continue doing this because you're hurting yourself and it hurts me to see you do this. Yeah. Therefore, you know, I, I'm setting my clear boundaries. Yeah. Um, it's helpful for them to hear that, that I love you. I care for you. I think it's very important. Yeah. Generally people with addictions tend to feel, um, you know, they have low self-esteem. They have the belief system is all skewed. So this, yeah. yeah, I think many, many a times when you see a, a substance abuse or, or addiction starting at a young age, you always tend to look back at the family and look into the family dynamics. Mm. Uh, normally, it has uh, uh, a source uh, from the family. Mm. Uh, youngsters, uh, uh, um, if, if it's uh, women, uh, young girls, always look for trauma, trauma, uh, trauma. For abuse. I think statistics has actually shown mm. very, very high uh, significant statistics when you actually look at addiction in, in, in girls, especially young girls or those in their teens. Always go back and look at uh, trauma or abuse in the family or in the environment. Very important. Okay. And a lot of things that uh, seem to be relating uh, trauma induced trauma to, to substance use. Self medicating yeah. theory as well. You know, they use it to sub medicate. The Extra stuff. work. You need to work with the family. You need yeah. to work on trauma. You have to do trauma work. So there's this intensive amount of work. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't read all the questions. We only have about three minutes left, I think. So I'm, I'm going to pick something uh, here, which is related to triggers. Uh, I, I actually, I, I like the slide that Param shared earlier about HALT. Um, HALT is a very interesting concept. Hunger, hungry, angry, lonely, loneliness, and tired. And this is about, uh, uh, when you say 20 minutes, Param, yeah? You said 20 minutes for... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Could you, could you just elaborate a little bit about how to manage see, so so the thing is is like this you see it, it is not really a fixed time that you have yeah. 20 minutes it varies from each individual yeah. some individual uh, it depends on how, how what sort of exposure he has in drinking and things like that so the time duration may vary for some people it might be a bit longer too 
especially if the yeah, psychosocial uh, stressor is still persistent. For example, he has a marital problem or financial problem. That urges is not going to stop in 20 minutes because that the problem is still there. So it's not resolved. So maybe it will last longer. But the actual physical or the immediate emotional feeling will last that duration at least kind of thing. So during that period, he needs to uh, relook at uh, and uh, reanalyze himself, especially his emotion. So saying that, okay, yeah, I do not feel good. I feel like drinking, but then, so I do not want to drink because it goes into my, it'll spiral up my life uh, and leading back to alcohol again. So what can I do at this? So the strategies are discussed and uh, rearranged prior to this so that he just have to follow the strategies. For example, so during that period, maybe he call up a friend or call up a family member, say that I'm a bit down now, I, I don't feel good. So perhaps that would be helpful or make a drink for himself, you know, coffee or tea or something like that. So, so you can do something which is immediate, something which is long term. So the immediate ones, so he does that. If it doesn't work, then he has to increase the uh, level of uh, 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 what you call um, intensity. So perhaps you know, it doesn't work. So he goes and take a shower. Uh, the shower doesn't work. Then maybe he takes a car, takes a drive, go, goes and visit his mom or visit someone else. So it's kind of like the intensity has to keep on going. But at the same time, there are certain things unresolved. For example, this person is staying far away and is working alone, is staying alone and, and, and kind of like, so he needs really help because he doesn't have anyone there. So this is where like, you know, uh, uh, AA, uh, Alcoholic Anonymous comes into play and things like that, getting a sponsor, going, attending Alcoholic Anonymous, getting a sponsor, will create that uh, emotional support for him. Okay. Or going to a hospital, uh, seeing a doctor, seeing a therapist also will be hel uh, helpful. So he needs to look at what are the things he can be done for the moment and as well as if the thing is going to persist, what, what can be done. Mm. And uh, other than that, during that period of time, yes, the intensity will increase. Sometimes it fluctuates. So when he fluctuates, this is when he can use this uh, so-called uh, urge surfing. So basically... He brings in the, this feeling that, you know, of drinking and, and he kind of, kind of hold on to it and pushes his, his limits till it goes off. Once he experienced this, subsequent uh, uh, visits of this urges is much easier for him to uh, deal with. The only thing is the first few times he needs a bit of practice, subsequently it's much easier to deal with it. So the only thing is during the first few sessions, Perhaps when he does it with the therapist, you know, maybe have a therapist, they can do it over the phone, talk to him, okay, maybe this feeling will go away, don't worry about it, we do as what we have uh, uh, discussed during the therapy session, then it will be helpful. So therefore, within that few uh, experience of that, he can handle it. Yes, sometimes it's very intensive. He knows it's a very high risk uh, situation. For example, he goes to a, 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 a birthday function or a function, and alcohol has been served, definitely he's going to have trouble. If you, if you want to use this kind of tactic, that it's not going to work because alcohol is in front of him. So it will be difficult. So perhaps he has to make a decision to leave that uh, place to, to safeguard him from uh, relaxing. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, okay. I know it's a, that, that is a good example that you just gave um, about going to an, a function where there's alcohol. Yeah. Well, ideally, if you can, I mean, avoid the function. Don't avoid, yeah. Right? But then if you have to go for whatever reason and you know there's alcohol, there's, what we sometimes tell uh, people is that take someone with you, you know, yes. if you can. Sure. Yeah? Sure. Um, or you plan what time you're going to leave. If you know people are going to start drinking at 7 o'clock, then maybe right. at 6.30, you know, you leave. Yes. Or ask someone to call you at about 6.30 to, to, yes. to bring you out or something like that. Techniques. I think what you're, yes. what you're saying are techniques. Yes. Yeah. Technique, yeah. Okay. True. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think uh, we, we have done quite well as far as time is concerned. Uh, also considering the follow-up blips and blunders that I did. <laughs> I apologize again for that. Uh, I, I would like to just summarize quickly by saying that, um, you know, this addiction, whether it's alcohol or, or drugs or behavioral addictions or substance addictions, is a chronic relapsing disorder. I think we, we, we all know that. And... Uh, this pandemic, this you know, COVID or, or whatever has come, maybe it has it has shaken things up a little bit more. It has given us more work. It has put us uh, on our toes to be more alert and, and to look out for things. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, there's a lot of education that's going out now, like this webinar. 
I, I bet, thank you all very much for doing this. You've taken time. I know we have reached quite a few people out there um, who will benefit from this. And I'm looking at it from a positive perspective that we are now able to communicate to more people and be able to educate the public that treatment is possible. Recovery is definitely possible. And there are experts who are willing to help at any point of time. Um, again, if there's anyone who wants to say a last round of anything you want to add? Yeah. Okay. All thank good. you all very much. Have a good evening right. and uh, stay safe. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Thank, uh, thank, thank you for everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Stay safe, guys. Bye. Okay. Bye.